Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at how memory timings work and why we even have them, because I get a lot of comments from people asking me to make a video explaining what all the different memory timings do. And I'm assuming the reason why people want to know what all the different timings do is because they think that understanding what a memory timing does will allow you to, like, skip a lot of the brute force trial and error that is memory overclocking. Well, I've got some really bad news for you. Knowing what basically any memory timing does, like, a de like in-depth understanding of what all the different memory timings do does absolutely nothing for reducing, amount, reducing the amount of brute force trial and error that you have to do when, when memory overclocking uh, because of how RAM works and why we even have memory timings. And that's, that's why I'm making this video because uh, even if you know what a TRCD is um, or a TCL is or a TRP is or a TRAS, which TRAS is a really funny timing, um, Knowing what any of these timings is really doesn't change the fact that you don't know how low they can go. Um, and there's no way to know ahead of time. So, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, let's get into it. So what we've got here is some public DDR5 mic uh, documentation from Micron for 8 gigabit DD I mean DDR4 documentation from Micron. Uh, I have, have attempted to shoot this video so many times. I, I've given up at this point. Like, no matter how bad this take is, it's going up. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> anyway, we've got a state diagram here. Um, this shows us basically everything the memory can do. It, it is simplified, but pretty much everything that a memory chip can do is in this diagram right here. And what might surprise you is, like, this really isn't that much. Because memory chips are really, really, really dumb. Which is why we have memory timings. Um, so we don't care about all of this over here because this is just some initialization setup type stuff. Th this is used to like boot the me like start the memory and configure it um, before it before you start actually do reading and writing uh, to it. Right. Um, this is some power saving stuff that we don't care about. Um, we also have self refresh, which I not actually sure what that what that's used for. We have regular refreshing, which we do care about, and then we have the most important part of the memory, which is this right here. We have reading and writing, and there's kind of a lot of steps in between reading and writing, um, or like well between reads and writes. So yeah. Anyway, this is the part of the diagram we really care about, as well as the refreshing part. Uh, for today. Uh, and here we have a list of pretty much all of the commands that a DDR4 memory chip can take. And you'll notice again that this list really isn't very long because memory chips are dumb. And the reason they're really dumb is because the number one priority for DDR memory chips since their conception has been to be cheap. Like, as cheap as possible. Um, the end result of this is that you have a very complex memory controller built into the CPU, but this is an accepted sort of, uh, design, like, sacrifice, because one very expensive memory controller can control potentially hundreds of memory chips. And so you want hundreds of dirt cheap memory chips that are incredibly stupid, and one very expensive smart memory controller. It also helps that the memory controller normally is manufactured on, like, a far more advanced process um, and can pull more power and, and, like, a lot of the concern, like, yeah. So, anyway, uh, memory chips are dumb. Here are all of the commands they can basically take. And the funny thing is we don't even care about most of these commands either because, like, this is some configuration stuff, more configuration stuff, power savings, more power savings. Uh, well, this one's very important. Uh, pre-charge and pre-charge all, also very important. Read and read with automatic pre-charge, important, because those, like, those are all commands that fall into the territory of this portion of the, the state diagram. Uh, then we have our refresh command, which, uh, is right there. Um, so we do care about that. We have reset, which is just for the startup procedure, right? If you go back to the diagram, there's your reset command. So we don't care about that. That's initialization stuff. Self-refresh. I'd, I'd have to look up what a self-refresh is. Um, we have some boundary scan mode. Some I'm pretty sure that's... In it. Yeah, that's more initialization stuff. 
Uh, write commands, of course, very important. And then we have some impedance calibration, which we do not care about because that's part of the initialization procedure. Um, so basically, we, we just have activate commands, precharge commands, read commands, refresh commands, and write commands. And the timings basically just govern the delays between sending all of these commands. Um, that's, that's it. And the reason why we need to delay commands with timings is because memory chips are really, really stupid. So, if we go back to our state diagram, once the memory chip is, you know, initialized and configured and it's not refreshing itself and it's not in power down mode and it's not self-refreshing, it's at idle. Uh, also assuming that we're not actively reading or writing. Like, we have an idle memory chip. Um, and we want to read or write. In this case, we're going to go with read because read operations are a bit less weird. Um, so the first thing we need to do with our idle memory chip is we need to tell it to activate a row, um, which we do with the activate command, right? Um, and the way this works is if we look at this functional block diagram of a DDR4 memory chip, also from the same Micron documentation, um, the activate command comes over comes in over here to the control logic of the memory chip and with that activate command We also send some address information. We send a row address a bank address and a bank group address now DDR4 just has a like internal structure of having banks in bank groups if you had DDR3 you don't have bank groups you just have banks so in a typical like one in one rank of DD in a single DDR3 memory chip um, assuming that we're not talking about the abomination that is an X16 device. Um, <laughs> like, assuming a proper memory chip that's X8, which means 8-bit wide data output, um, or, well, data input output, because the, the data queue is actually multi-purposed. You don't have separate inputs and outputs. The, the inputs and outputs are the same thing. Um, but... Uh, Anyway, so we have an eight wide, you know, in in an uh, input output on this memory chip. If it was DDR3, you'd just have four banks in it. Uh, DDR4, for reasons that we're not going to get into, has bank groups, and an X8 memory chip has four bank groups, and in each bank group you have four banks. So it's like four sets of DDR3 shoved into one memory chip, kinda, and that's sort of the intentional, like that's sort of the idea behind it, but. Anyway, so we need to tell the memory chip in which bank group and like which bank or which row in which bank of which bank group we want to activate, right? So that, that's what we're specifying with our address information when we send our activate command. So the memory chip gets the activate command, it gets all of this address information, and then it goes along and it fetches the information from the memory array, like it fetches that row out of the memory array and it puts it into the sense amplifiers. And then once it finishes moving the data into the sense amplifiers, it has completed the activation command and it does absolutely nothing. And at this point you might be wondering, wait, so how do I know that the activate command completed? And that's the thing, you don't. So how do you know when you can send your read command, right? Because like, in this diagram, we go from idle, we send our activate command, the memory chip activates the row we specified, and so now we have a, you know, active bank with an active row in it, and so now we want to go to a read, but we, we don't know when that bank is going to be active, because we sent an activate command and the memory chip never, like, it never tells us, hey, your bank is now active. So, how do we solve this? With timings. If we just assume that given enough time, the memory chip will complete the activation command, we can send the read command on the assumption that the row is active. If it isn't active and you send the read command too early, you get data corruption, because either the data isn't in the sense amplifiers, in which case I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you just get sent a bunch of zeros, you might get sent the previous data that you read, or who knows what you might end up with. Either way, you're not getting whatever data you actually wanted to get, because it's not in the sense amplifiers when, by the time that you send your read command. Um, and so that's kind of the whole reason we have memory timings, is just the memory chip is really, really stupid. So when you send it a command, uh, it doesn't, like, it won't tell, like, there's no way for it to tell you that thing's completed. And so you just have to wait. And if you don't wait long enough, well, your data doesn't, 
you don't get your data or you or if you're writing the right the data doesn't get written properly or if you're refreshing and you don't give it enough time to finish refreshing well your data disappears right like that's basically the whole reason we have timings and so the jdec specification right so jdec basically is a uh, standards body for like s semiconductor stuff primarily dealing with like memory chips and NAND device like yeah various kinds of memory basically so like NAND devices DRAM that kind of thing so they come up with uh, official specifications like DDR4 2400 16 16 16 where basically a bunch of engineers that work at the various uh, memory manufacturers and also at JDEC um, which there's, as far as I know, there's quite a bit of overlap in that. Anyway, they get together uh, and they basically ask the question of, can we build memory chips that complete a row activation in less than 13.32 nano, uh, nanoseconds, right? There's our units over here. Can we build memory chips that complete a row activation this quickly? And can we do it at a reasonable cost because again the number one priority with ddr memory chips is cheap they have to be cheap so <laughs> the number one priority here is like can can we complete a row activation in this much time assuming standard operating temperature range from minus 40 degrees all the way up to 85 degrees celsius um there's extended temperature ranges for like industrial applications all the way up to like 105 um, though I don't think I've ever seen a memory chip spec for 105. I've seen spec for 95, but not 105. Maybe I've not looked that hard. Um, anyway, consumer memory typically just has memory chips rated for 85 degrees Celsius. It really doesn't matter that much. If your RAM is at 85 degrees Celsius, you have other issues, in my opinion, that you should be, uh, uh, like, trying to solve. Um, anyway, um... And also at the stand, like in the standard voltage uh, tolerance range, because obviously DDR4 is specified for an average voltage of 1.2 volts, but voltage regulation is not perfect, so it's average 1.2 volts plus minus uh, some tolerance range, which I want to say off the top of my head is 5%. Um, and anyway, so, you know, the engineers at JDEC basically come up with a specification of like, yeah, if we can definitely build memory chips cheaply, that will always complete a row activation in under 13 nanoseconds, or, well, under 13.32 nanoseconds. In practice, the, basically any memory chip is going to do better than 13 nanoseconds, because you don't really... Like, if you're making memory chips that are at completing row activations in 13.31 nanoseconds, you don't really have much of a margin for manufacturing defects. Um... So that's kind of the thing. And so the official JDEC specification is just kind of like, yeah, if we uh, wait long enough for our various commands to complete, everything is fine. Um, right? And the JDEC specification goes all the way up to like DDR4 3200. Um, all, all over here, at which point the expectation is that you can complete a row activation in 13.75 nanoseconds or... 13.32, but I'm not sure what that note is for. Actually, let's go check. Uh, this value applies to non-native TCK, CL, CL, and RCD combinations. I'm not entirely certain what that means right now. So either way, we're just going to go with the 13.75 nanosecond value because that's what you get if you take 22 clock cycles and divide it by 1.6 gigahertz, which is the clock speed that the memory is actually... Or more like that's the clock that is used for running the commands at 3,200 megabits per second. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's basically how all of your memory timings work. If we keep scrolling down, um, we also have specifications for the refresh cycle and the refresh interval. The refresh interval is like basically the refresh interval is how often... Uh, the memory gets refreshed. Um, if you don't refresh all of your bank groups, your data disappears. Um, and then the TRFC, the refresh cycle time, is how long the memory spends refreshing itself. Basically, uh, when you send a refresh command, the memory will go through all of its banks and refresh the data in them. Uh, if you don't give it enough time to do that, your data disappears. Again, like basically anything with with refresh, anything related to refresh, if you don't, if it's set up wrong, your data disappears. Um, whereas with something like a row activation, if you don't give it enough time, it's not necessarily that your data disappears. 
It's just that your data might not like might not arrive, like it might get corrupted or something. Um, so you might get it partially or, you know, that kind of thing. Either way, from the software perspective, it gets sent stuff that isn't correct and you get a blue screen or a crash or an error or whatever. Um, but yeah, so we also have the, these specifications for the refresh cycle and the refresh interval. And all of these JDEC specifications are extremely generous because again, the goal is that these specs are easy to hit for the manufacturers. Like they want to be able to crank out, you know, millions of memory chips within these specifications. So the JDEC, like the timing requirements from JDEC are very, very forgiving, right? Um, like 13.75 nanoseconds, like literally any DDR4 memory chip is able to meet this part of the specification. Funnily enough, not all DDR4 memory chips will do 3200 megabits per second. Um, but the actual, in, like the internal timing for a, a row activation, like, that, that's no problem. Um, now then, when you're overclocking your memory, right? Let's say you picked up a, um, let's just use Samsung BDI because it's convenient. Um, so you can pick up a random uh, Samsung BDI stick that for whatever reason is actually at a 3200 JDEC spec instead of, um, like no nobody actually sells that. Like typically the Samsung BDI comes in like 3200 CL16 as a XMP, which is like that BDI is all over the place in terms of silicon quality. And then you have, of course, the 3200-14-14-14 bin, uh, which is actually consistently good. Like, that's actually just a straight-up good Samsung B-Dye bin. It's not completely random, like 3200-CL16 like is basically all over the place. 3466-CL16 is also kind of all over the place, but not anywhere near as bad as 3200-CL16 when it comes to Samsung B-Dye quality. Um, for other memory chips, it doesn't matter. Like, the, the thing is, like, you have a lot of memory chips that, um, like, the for example, the reason why 3200 16 18 18 is a very, very common, is like the standard XMP bin for DDR4 at 1.35 volts is because the vast majority of DDR4 memory chips uh, struggles to complete a row activation in less than 11 nanoseconds. So TRCD18 is like perfect at 3200 megabits per second because at one, like 18 clock cycles at 1.6 gigahertz is 11.25 nanoseconds of row like waiting for the row activation to complete. Whereas say a TRCD of 17 uh, would be uh, 10.625 nanoseconds and there's a decent number of memory chips that will not complete an activation in 10.625 nanoseconds even if you shove 1.6 volts into them. Like they're just bad at that. Okay, like that that's literally it. It's just the internal circuitry that handles the moving of the data from the memory array to the sense amplifiers just kind of sucks at doing its job on some memory chips because again, the spec requires that that circuitry completes that operation in less than 13.75 nanoseconds, which in the grand scheme of overclocked memory of overclocked DDR4 is an eternity. Um cuz like you know, Samsung BDI you can get, well, the, probably the most aggressive bin of Samsung BDI you can get is like 4,000 with a TRCD 15. 15 TRCD, 15 TRCD at 4,000 megabits per second is a row activation completed in less than 7.5 nanoseconds. It's not row activation completes in 7.5 nanoseconds. It means under 7.5 nanoseconds. That means the memory chip uh, like the slowest row activation in the memory chip still has to be shorter than 7.5 nanoseconds because otherwise the row won't be active by the time you send your read command and your data gets corrupted. So, well, more like you don't get the data that, that you wanted to read. Um, so that's that's kind of the thing. Um, so that's basically the most aggressive um, XMP bin that exists. And that's like almost half what the spec calls for. Right? <laughs> like that's approaching half of what the spec calls for. So, uh, yeah, um, that's kind of the, the thing with, with memory timings. But anyway, when, when you take a memory kit and you're overclocking it, what you're basically, or when you're tightening the memory timings and you're running a memory stress test, what you're doing is you're verifying that every single capacitor and every single transistor in the memory chip, uh, or like in every memory chip of your memory stick, is capable of completing whatever uh, command that timing governs 
in the amount of time that you've given it. So, you know, if you have like a good kit of Samsung BDI at 1.5 volts, it should be able to complete a TRC, like a, a row activation in, uh, yeah, 7.5 nanoseconds. Funny how that works. So you have a TRCD of 12 at 3200, right? Um, and that works out to under 7.5 nanoseconds. But if you have a, uh, like, terrible quality Samsung BDI kit, and they do exist, I have some, I have a, a lot of them, because I have a bad habit of going on eBay and buying literally anything that's, like, cheap, and it has the BDI, it has a BDI part number, and I'm like, how bad could it possibly be? And then it shows up, and it's terrible, and I'm like, why do I do this to myself? Um, anyway, so you might end up with something that's, actually, no, 16, uh, 10 nanoseconds is too long. Um, or you might end up with something that, like, struggles to complete a row activation in less than 9.2 nanoseconds, so you end up getting stuck with a TRCD of 15 at 3200 megabits per second, right? Or uh, the typical, like, good BDI XMP bin is 14, uh, is 14 at uh, 1.6 gigahertz, which is 8.75 nanoseconds, right? And that's at 1.35 volts. Now, the, the thing is, obviously, as you increase voltage on uh, Samsung BDI specifically, your TRCD actually comes down, which all that really means is that the circuitry that handles the row activation command, uh, that could be the row address mux, it could be the actual bank, like the memory array itself, or any number of things between like the address, like the inputs of the memory chip and the actual sam amplifiers, um, like some of that circuitry just speeds up as you apply more voltage to it. Funnily enough, on pretty much, on the vast majority of DDR memory chips, as far as I know, even memory chips where like cranking the voltage up doesn't help the, t the row activation time, um, Lower temperatures help row activations, just across the board. Like, SK Hynix DDR5 is a great example of this, but a bunch of SK Hynix DDR4 is also a great example of this. There's a bunch of DDR3 that does incredibly low, fast row activations when it's very, very cold. And when I say very cold, we're talking, like, below minus 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so liquid nitrogen cooling on the memory. Um, funnily enough, most memory chips do not have their row activation speed up with voltage. Samsung BDI is a like crazy anomaly in the sense that more voltage makes the row activation process go faster. Most memory chips do, however, benefit from applying more voltage when it comes to the cast latency timing, uh, which basically is related to sort of this part of the memory chip. So shoving more voltage into most memory chips does speed up this portion of the memory chip. Um, Though on some memory chips, shoving more voltage into them actually causes issues with the actual like data in like signal, at least seems to cause issues with signal integrity. Um, and you can also have memory chips that have signal integrity issues related to temperature. There's a lot of like early production Samsung BDI where if it gets too cold, uh, it just is impossible to run. So, and when I say gets too cold, I mean like you take those six, uh, the, the sticks below like 10 degrees Celsius. So you don't even need to go sub zero. You can just have them at like, like you, you could open a window in the, in winter. And it, if your memory sticks reach ambient temperature, they stop being stable because you'll just have like impede. I'm guessing it's probably related to some kind of impedance matching issue between the memory stick and the motherboard and the memory controller, but Either way, so when you're running a memory stress test, what you're doing is you're, like, ideally what you're trying to do is verifying that every single transistor and, like, well, basically every single transistor and wire and capacitor making up your memory chip is capable of completing every command in the amount of time that you allow the command to take based on your memory timings. Right, because the thing is with your memory timings, you aren't, when you lower a memory timing, you aren't telling the memory chip, hey, you have to go faster. You're saying, I am willing to wait less time for this operation to complete. The memory chip isn't going to do a row activation any faster with a TRCD of 14 than it is with a TRCD of 8, okay? Um, and that's like DDR3 style timings. Um, actually, TRCD of 8 is extremely low for most DDR3 as well, so... I should have probably gone for like something like 12 versus uh, 8 or uh, or for DDR4 it would be like 12 versus, uh, I don't know, 18. Yeah, at 3200 TRCD of 12 versus 18, like you're not, you're not going to force a 
you know, Hynix CJR memory stick to complete a row activation in 7.5 nanoseconds by lowering the TRCD, it's just not going to freaking finish the row activation by the time your read command shows up and you're, you don't get your data. Um, and that's kind of all they're really, and th that's why memory overclocking is such a, t t like, tedious, time-intensive, brute force trial and error process, because you're literally trying to figure out if every single part of the memory chip can complete an operation in the amount of time that you've given it. And that's all you're doing um, with memory overclocking. Um, and you can fiddle with the voltage, like, and the thing is you also need, like, you're, like, there's other, vari like, there's variables like the temperature of the memory chip, the voltage of the memory chip, right? Voltage regulation isn't perfect, which is why when you run a memory stress test, if you're right on the edge, you get some errors. And if you're significantly past the edge, you get a lot of errors. And if you're way beyond the capabilities of the memory chip, uh, the memory controller will get, like, the CPU will get through this portion of the diagram, which we don't really care about. Like, it'll finish setting up the memory chip, it'll try to write some data to it, and that data will just never get written, or will be impossible to read. Either way, you're never gonna get to the, like, BIOS splash screen, because it'll be literally impossible to fun- like, the memory will be non-functional, because you will be trying to do things uh, entirely too quickly relative to the, in, like, the capabilities of the memory chip's internal circuitry. Um, so you might be able to, like, write some data, but you won't ever be able to read it if your, like, cast latency is too low. Or, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then with the refresh timings, it's a bit simpler because, um, well, if you don't give your memory chip enough time to refresh, your data disappears. If you try to refresh too infrequently, um, because the spec is that you're supposed to refresh every 7.8 microseconds. That is a, like, this is 7,800 nanoseconds. Just pointing that out, because we've been talking nanoseconds for a while now. Uh, refresh interval is specced in microseconds, which is a thousand times larger than a nanosecond. And I'm specifying this because I keep seeing people talking about memory latency in freaking milliseconds. Like, did you not go to school? <laughs> anyway... Um, yeah, so refresh interval is specced in microseconds, and the expectation is that memory chips will retain data reliably for 7.8 microseconds from minus 40 degrees all the way up to 85 degrees Celsius. Funnily enough, if you're overclocking on a 12th gen Intel CPU, Intel's refresh interval register allows you to punch in a refresh interval of 262,000 clock cycles. Which at, uh, say, uh, 1.6 gigahertz memory clock, so that would be 3200 megabits per second data rate, is 163 microseconds, which is just completely insane. Also, another funny thing about the refresh interval is this actually gets tighter as you increase your memory frequency. Because obviously, so if you're at 3200 megabits per second, Right, you end up, 262,000 ends up being a refresh interval of 163 microseconds, but that same 262,000 at, say, 4,000 megabits per second uh, is just, like, that's 2 gigahertz uh, memory clock is 131 microseconds. Um, also, this formula spits out the, the values in nanoseconds, which is why I'm ignoring the three zeros at the end. These are 131,000 nanoseconds, therefore 131 microseconds. I can't believe I'm doing, like... I'm I'm pretty sure they teach freaking unit prefixes in middle school, but anyway, um, yeah. So the JDEC specifications are extremely loose, and when you start messing with your memory timings, all you're really doing is asking the question of, "Hey, can this memory chip not corrupt my data if I spend let like change how long I'm willing to wait for certain things to happen?" Because um, yeah. And this is why knowing what all of the memory timings do doesn't really help you overclock your memory. Like, it will prevent you from doing some things that are just physically impossible. Like, there are certain time, like, there are certain timings that you can't uh, set, like, well, if you set them a certain way, it does, nothing happens. Or if you set them too low, the memory controller will just ignore whatever you punched in. Um, there, are, there are safeguards for, like, really bad decision making with well, like if you punch in values that are entirely impossible the memory controller will just ignore them um so 
You don't really need to know what all the memory timings do, because when I pick up a random stick of RAM, right, there is no measurement I can take, there is no test I can run to see what kind of timings it can do, except to lower the timings and then try to run a memory stress test and quickly find out that it's vomiting errors for reasons I don't understand. And if you change too many timings at the same time, you end up in that awkward situation of it's not stable and I have no idea why. Um, at the same time going, you know, one like one timing at a time, running a stress test each time is also incredibly time intensive and really inefficient. Um, but yeah, there's there's just not really anything you can you can do about that because, like, if you, like, th like the memory chip won't tell you that you're trying to do something too quickly, it'll just corrupt your data. Or if you're trying to wait too long, like if you're if you delay your refresh for too long, suddenly your data disappears. The memory chip won't tell you, hey, I really need to refresh now. The data's starting to decay into oblivion. It just disappears, and then when you try to read the data, you get a bunch of zeros, and the like, not the memory chip's fault, your fault. Um, so, same thing for like the refresh cycle, if you don't give the memory chip enough time to refresh itself, data disappears. And when you try to read that data, you get a bunch of zeros. Um, and, yeah, that's... That's basically it for how, how memory timings work. And this video keeps getting longer and longer and longer, and I don't know why. Anyway, um, yeah. So basically, if you've been worrying about changing your memory timings because you don't know what all the fancy letters mean, I've got news for you. You don't really need to know what most of them do, but I will tell you a general uh, rule of thumb. Most, like, most timings have a lower, li a lo well, okay, no. A lot of timings have a lower limit of four. So trying to punch in something that's less than four is unlikely to work for a lot of things. And there's a very, like, there's a reason for that, but we're not going to get into that why. Um, I might do videos in the future explaining what all the different memory timings do. Um, but that is going to be many, many, many videos because a lot of the timings are extremely contextual. And by that, I'll give you an example of, say... Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, let's take a look at read operation. And then we open this up and you'll see, like, we have read burst, read operation followed by another read operation, read operation followed by a write operation, read operation followed by a pre-charge operation, read operation with data bus inversion. Actually, I don't think we really need to care about that. Read operation with command address power. I don't think we care. Uh, read operation followed by write with, like, Oh, actually, there's like, yeah, and, and you have the same kind of thing for write operations with like uh, write burst operation, write with another write, write with a read, write, uh, write with a pre-charge. So, yeah. Also, why is this all blurry? Anyway. Uh, oh, it actually went and skipped to there. So, yeah. That's, that's how RAM timings work, and why we have them is literally because the memory chip is too stupid to tell you when it's done doing things. So you just kind of have to assume that if you wait long enough, things will be finished, on will be finished and you're going to get your data. Um, a funny consequence of this is, like, you don't know if a read operation completed correctly until you try to read the data which is kind of fun to think about. Like, you could write to a memory chip, and until you tried to read, you don't actually know if it wrote anything whatsoever. Um, but, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's it for the video. So thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the HOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, hoodies, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. I also have a band camp. You might want to check that out. There's a link to that down in the description below as well and, and, the, uh, and the Teespring store. So yeah, there's links in the description. Go check them out if you'd like to support the channel. Uh, it does help out immensely. And that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.